In Rocky Mountain streams in East China, you would find the largest amphibian in the world, the Chinese giant salamander. Unfortunately, for a number of reasons, these creatures are critically endangered and are near extinction. Turn the clock back beyond 200 million years ago and giant amphibians are far more diverse and common, even dominating some habitats. A group of extremely diverse amphibians called Temnospondyls were arguably the most successful amphibians that ever lived. During their 200 million year reign on this planet, they occupied all sorts of niches including sometimes developing scales and being almost completely terrestrial, not to mention growing to monstrous proportions on occasion. Although Chinese giant salamanders can potentially grow up to 1.8 meters, making them as long as a human in some instances, some Temnospondyls were four times this length. To find when Temnospondyls first appeared, you would need to travel back 330 million years to the Carboniferous period, which is dating to the beginning of terrestrial vertebrates altogether. Temnospondyls were tetrapods, which meant that their limbs were far more leg-like than earlier, more fish-like amphibians such as Hydnerpotan. Some of these earlier forms would also include the strange-looking Crassigorinus, sometimes referred to as the giant carnivorous tadpole because of how small its limbs were. Having said this though, Temnospondyls were very diverse and even their basal members occupied several niches with some fairly aquatic creatures like Cochleosaurus. Europe and North America were covered in extensive lowland swamp during the Carboniferous, making it the ideal habitat for amphibians. However, one group of Temnospondyls called Disorophidae continued to become more terrestrial in the latter half of the Carboniferous by developing solid vertebrae and stronger and more defined limbs. One of their most interesting features was that some of them had many small teeth in the roof of their mouth in addition to their normal teeth, giving them an extremely menacing appearance. Disorophids probably lived a lot like woodland salamanders, which are amphibians but they inhabit woodlands remaining mostly terrestrial throughout their life. Due to the lack of competition on land at this time in the Earth's history, the Disorophidae soon became very successful terrestrial creatures. However, despite how at home they may seem in terrestrial habitats, they were still amphibians and were tied to the water for their reproduction cycle. This was because amphibians' eggs don't retain water well since they lack an amnione, and so can dry out easily so must be laid in the water and amphibians usually have a fully aquatic life stage as well. Our ancestors at this time had evolved the ability to lay their eggs on land as they were better at retaining water. This is because they have evolved an amnion which is a protective membrane that covers the fetus and is why these creatures were referred to as amnio. This meant that their eggs were at a lower risk of predation, but also allowed these creatures to move into drier habitats with lower amounts of water. At the end of the Carboniferous, about 305 million years ago, the world underwent a minor extinction event called the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. The causes are not well understood and were probably multifaceted. It was categorized by sea levels dropping, rapid temperature changes, and at the end there was a drier overall climate. Rainforests and wetlands were becoming less common including a huge reduction in ancient tree-like plants called Lepidodendron that were the size of trees yet produced spores similar to how ferns produce. This minor extinction event was not favorable to amphibians that saw a small decline in numbers, especially the more terrestrial orientated ones. Reptiles and other non-amphibian tetrapods fared better during this period due to being more adaptable to drying climates. This was the start of a trend that would continue, of the amniotes asserting their dominance over terrestrial habitats and the more terrestrial amphibians diminishing. During the Permian, the increasing aridity saw a large decline of terrestrial species of Temnospondyl, though they still flourished in the freshwater rivers and lakes. Some of these creatures evolved into ferocious semi-aquatic predators like Ereops that first appeared at the end of the Carboniferous and survived into the Permian. Ereops was commonly around 1.5 meters long, but could maybe reach sizes of 3 meters long, making them some of the largest creatures of their day. These semi-aquatic predators would continue to be successful. Crocodiles had not yet evolved, and so their niches were filled by these giant amphibians. One group of Temnospondyls called Archegosauridae would go a step further by converging on the same body shape as well, forming a long snout. They also possessed different shaped snouts, with some being wider or more narrow for doing different jobs, which is similar to crocodiles today. One of the members of this group was called Prionosuchus that had upper estimates of being 9 meters long, meaning it was more massive than the largest saltwater crocodile on record and the largest amphibian ever. Its long thin snout resembled that of the fish-eating gharial, and so perhaps lived in a similar way. The Permian period ended 252 million years ago with the worst mass extinction in history, and one of the main tenets of this extinction event was a huge increase in global temperatures. This made the earth even drier, which meant that amphibians were heavily affected, along with many other creatures. Amphibians very quickly bounced back though. A new group that first appeared at the end of the Permian, called the Sterospondyls, rose up and took over the leftover niches in the Triassic. 
In the mid-Triassic, about 235 million years ago, there was a quick climate changing event that saw the dramatic increase in rainfall. This was intense enough to change ecosystems, which became far wetter than the intolerable dryness of the early Triassic. A relatively large aquatic amphibia known as Metoposaurus saw a huge proliferation after the climate changing event. They became staggeringly common with countless fossils being known from ancient riverbeds on several continents. During the Triassic, amphibians weren't just tried to freshwater though, as there were creatures like Traumatosauroids that had adapted to live in marine habitats and seemed to be quite at home in coastal regions. Other than some specific amphibians like the crab-eating frog that can make brief excursions into the ocean, there are no fully oceanic amphibians alive today. The reptiles and other amniotes had long dominated the terrestrial leashes, but during the Triassic we would see a much higher representation of reptiles in aquatic habitats as well. There were phytosaurs and other crocodile-like aquatic reptiles along with turtles now competing for semi-aquatic niches. Due to this change, the giant amphibians started to disappear and were nearly completely wiped out by the early Triassic. However, despite this shift in power, one temnospondyl clung on until the Cretaceous. 120 million years ago, Australia was much closer to the South Pole, with some other continent even being within the Antarctic Circle. It would have been very cold and heavily forested with evidence of sea ice during the winter. And in the rivers and lakes of this habitat you would find Coolasuchus, the last temnospondyl. It was about 4 meters long and unlike other earlier temnospondyls resembled modern salamanders. It is thought that it was too cold for crocodilians this far south, and amphibians usually fare slightly better in the winter, so Coolasuchus was never outcompeted like other amphibians. Unfortunately, this didn't last, as annual temperatures increased 110 million years ago and crocodiles returned to the area, which is when this giant went extinct. Many believe that modern amphibians, salamanders and frogs that are known as Lysamphibia, evolved from Temnospondyls, specifically from the Dicerophidae group, so although these giant amphibians died out, and they may not be the dominant animals anymore, their legacy may still be with us. A massive thank you goes to Karim and Fozzleworth and my other patrons for supporting me. If you would like to support me as well, then you can go to patreon.com forward slash mothlightmedia and make a pledge. If you would like to be updated of future content, then consider subscribing. Thank you for watching.